Cultural Resource Laws and Practices, Practice, Chapter 4, Part 3. I've had issues with my video this morning. I'm so sorry about that. Finding Historic Places, Some Myths. Before we move on to actually finding historic places, let's dispense with some widely held er but erroneous beliefs about the identification process. There is a widespread belief that Section 106 or the regulations require agencies to do a survey. They don't. A related myth is that agencies have to identify all historic properties in the ape, usually by doing some kind of complete survey. This too is myth, all myth. The regulations don't require any particular kind of identification. They require a reasonable and good faith effort to identify historic properties. And that's historic properties, not all historic properties, unquote. The regulations don't require identification of everything for two reasons. First, it's impossible. You can't know what you haven't found. Second, it's unnecessary. The rule of thumb is that you should go, you should do enough to understand what effects are likely and what can be done about them. How much and what kind of identification that means depends on the nature of the likely effects, the nature of the area, and the nature of the likely historic properties, among other things. Then there's the myth that you have to do some standard kind of survey, perhaps called a class one or phase one. This isn't true either. And it's a ter terrible idea because it encourages root rote thinking. Standards class for one surveys and phase two, type 2B and so on are variously set forth in state, regional and agency guidelines. They vary from place to place, but one thing is pretty universal. They emphasize archeological survey, field survey. They go on to loving detail about how closely spaced archeologists should be over the landscape and at what intervals they should dig holes in order to find, quote, all site, all the sites. But some historic properties aren't sites and some aren't best found or evaluated by looking at or digging in the ground. Historic buildings, districts, landscapes, and traditional cultural properties require different strategies, ranging from aerial remote sensing to talking with local residents to background historical research to geomorphology. Sorry. Whenever we assume that a particular class of survey will automatically be sufficient and that it is automatically required, we fail to think what, through what kinds of study are really needed. This can lead us to miss important stuff. However, closely we pack our archeologists and space our holes. Bottom line, there is no specific kind of survey you've got to do to satisfy section 106. What you have to do depends on the character of the project and its likely effects and on the character of the properties likely to be present, which can be determined only through background research and consultation. You don't need necessarily to have to necessarily have to identify every historic property subject to effect, but you do need to consider all kinds of historic properties, not just those you happen to be trained to identify and appreciate. The rule is to make a reasonable effort in good faith. In almost no case, though, is it enough to just send an archaeologist or anybody else out to look around, whether they're just looking aimlessly or looking in a highly organized manner on five meter transects, digging holes every four meters, there was a case in India in which the archaeologist surveying a highway borrow, burrow source missed the big Hopewell mound into which it would be dug. The site was so big it, that it dwarfed the survey area. That's a pretty unusual situation in archaeology, but it's easy to have a historic landscape or an urban historic district that stretches far, far beyond the project site and even beyond the boundaries of the ape. 
you've got to back up and look at the big picture in order to see it. Some kinds of properties don't look like anything at all, or rather they just look like hills or streams or rock outcrops or groves of trees or meadows or commercial streets. To understand their importance, you've got to talk to the people who value them and find out what they think is important. To figure out with whom to talk, you need to think about and read about and talk with people about what's known and believed about the area. That's what background research is all about. Incidentally, this sort of background assessment is another piece of work that's sometimes referred to as a class one or phase one survey. To the endless confusion of those who use the same term to mean a basic field inspection. The reasonable and good faith standard. <clears throat> so you've scoped your identification effort and discovered, let's say the following. The ape includes a hoity-toit historic district made up of mansions along hoity-toit road, a locally designated historic district that's included in the National Register. The Metomic Indian tribe, now resident on a reservation 50 miles away, used to occupy the area. Part of the ape is a floodplain covered with sediments deposited in the last 5,000 years. Much of the floodplain is farmed by Amish families. The town of Crossroads near the east end of the ape has been occupied by African-American families since the end of the Civil War. The crooked been unpleasantries, unpleasantness in which local militiamen massacred fleeing Metomics occurred somewhere along a bend in Messy Creek, which flows through the ape. The overworked, understaffed SHPO's office has given you a form letter rec recommending a class to a cultural resource survey, unquote. Professor R.T. Tooley of Giant State University's Geographic Research Center advises that the area may produce information important in the study of climatic change over the last 10,000 years. This information may present both in archaeological sites and in natural fault paint deposits. The regulations require that, based on your scoping, you make a reasonable and good faith effort, unquote, to identify historic properties in this case. Given the above data, what th does this mean? One of the most common and least useful responses is, it means to do what the SHPO tells you to do, unquote. This is not meant to insult SHPOs. It's just that in the, this case, as often happens, the SHPO's staff person has been busy with other things and has given you an off-the-cuff recommendation that isn't useful. What does the SHPO mean by a Class 2A cultural resource survey? Unquote. Like Class 1 or Phase 1 survey, which naturally leads to cl a class two or a phase two, it's probably a standard kind of field work promoted by the state's archeological community. It probably means particular personal qualifications spacing archeologists on the ground and test pit intervals, or it may be product oriented. A sufficiently detailed study to permit de determining eligibility for the National Register when you ask what this means, you usually, you're usually told something about doing test ex excavations. The problem, of course, is that the survey standards that prescribe test excavations to determine eligibility may not identify anything but archaeological sites. And a standard form archaeological survey that doesn't consider local conditions may not even archeological sites. If they're deeply buried in those floodplain sediments, you may spend a lot of time and money tra traipsing archeologists over the floodplain, digging holes every few meters and never getting down to the level where you there are actually archaeological sites and you're, while you're spending your time and money on all this, you're probably not identifying any of the non-archaeological historic properties that are there.
So what should you do? Use your background data and your head and talk with people. The Hoity Toit Historic District is already listed in the register, but don't trust the register data to be comprehensive. It may be that Hortense Hoity Toit nominated the district back in 1972 on the basis of a very narrow range of significance criteria. Perhaps she considered only the district's association with the Harry Hoity Toit, her grandfather, who brought the railroad to the area. So the documentation doesn't tell you that the district's elegant homes look eastward over the adjacent valley and are subject to visual impacts by, say, a highway passing up the valley as much as five miles away. It may not tell you about the mature oak trees in the district that are subject to damage by air pollution. Hortense may have drawn the boundaries of the district more or less or arbitrarily and left properties out that are significant in their own right. There may be buildings outside the district that are identical with those inside or maybe a little bit younger or less high style but still significant. There may be a group of commercial buildings a block away important in the history of the community's economic development. Hortense probably ignored the 2,000-year-old archaeological site that lies under 725 Hoity Toit Road. None of this indicates that Hortense was ill-intentioned or stupid. She just nominated what was important to her, and the register accepted it. The point is the fact that something is included in the register doesn't mean it's the only eligible thing around or that its eligibility has been comprehensively considered. You need to take another look at the district with specific reference to the potential impacts of your project and you're going to need to reconsider its boundaries and character too. In addition, you're going to need to look for, for other kinds of historic properties. The fact that the Matomic tribe occupied the area tips you off that it may contain places that the tribes care about. These may be archaeological sites and or traditional cultural properties that may constitute whole landscapes to find them. You may need to do some kind of archaeological survey, which may or may not fall into the class two a category. But most important, you need to get out and talk to, with the atomic this may be a job for someone who knows the Matomic well, perhaps for a member of the tribe and for an agency line officer if the Matomic are federally recognized. Speaking of archaeological sites, the fact that the ape includes a floodplain covered with 5,000-year-old sediments suggests a couple of things. First, there may be buried archaeological sites in those sediments that could be quite old and perhaps quite significant for research and public interpretation. Second, as mentioned surveying, the surface of the floodplain may be a fruit, pretty fruitless endeavor, though this depends on how fast the floodplain has built up and how young the sediments are on the surface. With deeply buried archaeological sites, you also need to do to think about whether your project can actually affect them. If the project will disturb only the top meter of the floodplain and the sites are likely to be 12 meters down, there's probably not much point in disturbing the sediments to find them. You may need to do you may do more damage than construction will. Since the floodplain is farmed by Amish families, you need to consider whether it's got historical value for its association with the Amish and their traditional lifeways. And you'll need to talk with the Amish too. Again, work for a knowledgeable person who appreciates Amish ways. Similarly, you need to talk with the people of, the, of Crossroads and look into the community's history to see whether it constitutes a historically or culturally significant resource or whether there are places that its residents value. The pool in the creek where baptisms are carried out perhaps or the fishing bridge, archival research into the crooked bend unpleasantness perhaps coupled with aerial photography or other forms of remote sensing, may help you identify the massacre site, which may be eligible for the National Register. Interviewing willing Matomics is likely to be important too, 
There may be traditions about the place and e the event that can help pinpoint its location and el elucidate its significance. Finally, and considering the possible significance of archaeological sites in the floodplain, you'll need to respect Professor Toole's concerns about climatic change. These research interests aren't the only basis for regarding archaeological sites or other sites as eligible for the National Register, but they certainly are one basis and one important one. <clears throat> so it looks like you need need to deploy an army of historians, architectural historians, archaeologists, landscapes historians, and cultural anthropologists to figure out what's important in your project's ape. In some cases, this is true, particularly if your project is a big one with lots of far-reaching complex potential effects. But in most cases, it doesn't have to be true. You need to look at uh, what kinds of impacts your project is actually likely to have and adjust your identification accordingly. If you're planning on a 500 kilowatt volt power line on giant towers marching through the countryside, you ought to worry about visual effects on things like historic buildings, districts and landscapes, and a lot less about impacts on archaeological sites. If you're planning a fiber optic cable in the ground through the same landscape, archaeology is going to be a problem, but visual effects probably won't. The nature of the likely effect determines the kinds of properties likely to be affected and how they're likely to be affected, and hence the kind of work you need to do to identify them and the kinds of expertise you need to do the identifying. In some cases, particularly where the project is a small one with a limited range of probable impacts, all the needed expertise may reside in a single head because they've most like, mostly been the ones who have wound up running Section 106 shops in the agencies, SHPO, the THPO offices and consulting firms. There are quite a few archaeologists who have become more or less able to identify and evaluate things other than archaeological sites, building structures, landscapes, and traditional cultural places. Some historians, too, have become Jack and Jill's of all historic preservation trades, and sometimes you'll find an architectural historian who's developed multidisciplinary, multi-resource expertise. People who've come through the historic preservation or cultural resource management CRM graduate programs or graduate certificate programs may have developed this kind of expertise too, but don't count on it. Lots of historic preservation programs basically train people in applied architectural history and historic, historical architecture, while many CRM programs teach little more than applied archaeology. Hint, for students, if you want to be really employable in CRM, get training in more than one preservation related discipline. It should make you a hot commodity. Another hint, <clears throat> it's during identification, notably during the first step assessing information needs that you can most effectively identify not only historic properties, but also people who may be concerned about the project's effects. The regulations encourage consulting people who may have knowledge of or concerns about historic properties in the area. Treat this as an opportunity, not at an onerous requirement, but to identify concerned people as a certain their concerns and consult them at this early stage than to have them pop up in court when you're ready to go into construction. It's by talking with these those people that you can best identify the kinds of properties that people really care about, even though the people you talk with may not call them historic properties or even speak your language. It's still likely to be their cultural oxen that will be gored by your project and you or your client would do well to know what they're concerned about as early as possible. Specific versus generalization identification. 
One of the most unfortunate legacies of the Section 106's relationship with the National Register is the tendency, particularly on the part of SHPOs, to think that a reasonable and good faith effort to identify historic properties must include identifying specific fully defined pro historic properties, preferably documented to the satisfaction of the otherworldly nitpickers at the National Register. This is utter pernicious nonsense that makes it almost impossible to deal with broad, often ill-defined, but very significant property types like landscapes and e equally in a chote, indirect and cumulative effects. The regulations do not require that every single historic property be identified or documented in any particular way. It is perfectly all right to say on the basis of Consul consultation and background research, it looks like the very pretty valley may be a National Register eligible cultural landscape. And though the proposed spin around bypass will intrude only slightly on its southeastern margin, it will likely accelerate the pave of sprawl development that is already beginning to nibble at the edges of the valley. Therefore, there will be adverse effect, effects that need to be resolved, unquote. That it, it is perfectly all right. As far as the regulations are concerned, it may not be all right with your state's, state highway agency, which doesn't want to address cumulative effects and for reasons discussed in Chapter 5, doesn't want to acknowledge adverse effects under Section 106 at all or with the SHPO or with the National Register. They all have their arguments and rationales, but for some, from the standpoint of sensible planning and resolution of real conflicts, they're all wrong. The Las Guaitas Canyon Standard. We have some guidance from courts of law about what con constitutes a reasonable and good faith identification effort under Section 106. The most useful such guidance I know of comes from Pueblo of Sandia versus United States. A 1995 Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals case involving a proposed management plan for Las Huertos Canyon in the Sibila National Forest near Albuquerque, New Mexico. The forest serves preferred alternative would <clears throat> change the road up the canyon and upgrade visitor use facilities. During review under NEPA and Section 106, the Forest Service determined that there were no TCPs involved in that the undertaking would have no effect on historic properties. The SHPO concurred the tribal government of Sandia Pueblo filed suit, alleging that there were important spiritual sites in the canyon and that in effect the canyon as a whole was a TCP the district court granted summary judgment for the Forest Service largely on the basis of the SHPO's concurrence the Pueblo appealed. <laughs> Meanwhile, the SHPO <clears throat> received information from the Pueblo backing up its contention about the canyon's cultural importance and affidavit by the Pueblo's own cultural anthropologist and a resolution by the Pueblo's council, it turned out that the Forest Service had this information at that at the time it was made. It's made its no TCPS's determination and had withheld it from SHPO. The SHPO withdrew his concurrence. The Court of Appeals reversed the district's court's decision and remained. Remanded the case for further proceedings. The ruling largely speaks for itself. The Forest Service mailed letters to local Indian tribes. The letters requested detailed information. Astonishingly, the Forest Service had written tribes in the area and asked them for written descriptions of any TCPSs in the canyon, including an explanation of their significance and a 7.5 minute U.S. geological survey quadrangle showing the sites and their boundaries. None of the tribes or individuals provided the type of information requested. <clears throat> 
Hardly a surprise, the Forest Service was asking the tribes to do its work for it and to reveal sensitive cultural information. We conclude, however, that the information the tribes did communicate to the agency was sufficient to require the Forest Service to engage in further investigations, especially in light of regulations warning that tribes might be hesitant to divulge the type of information sought. By regulations, the court seems to actually to mean National Register Bulletin 38. The court cited Bulletin 38 repeatedly as methodological guide and as an explanation of why the tribes might not have been willing to provide the requested details. National Register Bulletin 38 warns that knowledge of traditional cultural values may not be shared readily with outsiders. As such, information is regarded as powerful, even dangerous, in some societies. The court said that the Forest Service had the obligation to make its own reasoned decision about what kind of identification was needed. To, it could not do nothing just because the tribes hadn't provided precise, precisely the kind of information it requested. Going on to discuss the for what the Forest Service should have done to make a reasonable effort to identify TCPSs, the court said, determining what constitutes a reasonable effort depends on the likelihood, part of the likelihood that such properties may be present. National Register Bulletin 38, the information communicated to the Forest Service, as well as the Reasons articulated for the lack of more specific information clearly suggested that there is sufficient likelihood that the canyon contains traditional cultural properties to warrant further investigation. So the Forest Service should have used the data from the tribes together with other information as available, one might add, to determine what kinds of identification were needed. The tribe statement that were important cultural qualities to the canyon should have been enough to tip off the Forest Service to the need for detailed study. Turning to what constitutes a good faith effort, the court focused on the Forest Service's misleading interaction with the SHPO. According to the SHPO, an opportunity to offer input on potential historic properties would be meaningless unless the SHPO has access to available relevant information. Thus, consultation with the SHPO mandates an informed consultation. By withholding re relevant information from the SHPO during the consultation process, the Forest Service further undermined any argument that it had engaged in a good faith effort. I think we can extrapolate from Pueblo of Sandia to establish some standards for what constitutes a reasonable and good faith effort to identify not only TCPSs, but historic properties of all kinds. Writing letters is all right as part of background research, but it's not enough. The agency has to analyze all its relevant information and reach a defensible decision about what kind of identification to do. Factors that may affect some, someone's willingness to communicate about historic properties have to be thoughtfully considered. National Register bulletins provide guidance on identification. They should be thoughtfully considered. Consultation should be, must be informed. Consultation, an agency isn't acting in good faith if it withholds important data. Evaluation. Suppose you've done identification, whatever this may have entailed, and you've found something that might be eligible for the National Register, but you don't know whether it is. How do you decide? First, let's think about the phrase, something that might be eligible for the National Register and deciding that this thing might be eligible and this other thing surely is not. We're making value judgments and we ought to be careful. It's generally good to practice to assume something might be eligible unless it's clearly demonstrably isn't. Why? Maybe because you really, really don't want to mess up something important. If, you, if you're not the altruistic 
there's this finding that something you thought was insight insignificant really is significant late in the game can be embarrassing and costly suddenly your agencies or clients project is stopped the bulldozers are idling and eating up money the contractor is charging quintuple fees for sitting around twiddling his thumbs your boss or your sponsor or your congress person is screaming about obstructionists and the local citizenry, the archeological community, the Indian tribe, the SHPO, or somebody is screaming about violating the nation's cultural patrimony. patrimony. But of course there it has to be a rule of reason. The scatter of beer cans come along, along the roadside is something that qualifies as a might be eligible, unless of course the road is pretty old and the people who drank out of the cans were pretty important. Well, where do you draw the line? As usual, it depends. Age is part of the answer. Last night's beer cans don't possibly make up a site that might be eligible for the register, but a scatter of cans from 75 years ago just might. Association is another factor. Your cans or mine don't make an eligible site, but cans left by the first Vulcan expedition to Earth would be another matter. But how do you know whether the cans or the old foundation or the nondescript building are associated with something, someone or something important. You don't. You have to guess. When you push comes to shove, you have to exercise more or less unsubstantiated judgment or we'd never get anything done. We look at the scatter of cans, the corrugated tin gart garage, the fence line with the adjacent cow trail, the concrete foundation slab, or the local gas station, and say, no, it's not worth even thinking about. And having made that statement, feeling comfortable that nobody will argue with us about it, we then ignore the place and don't think about it anymore. Of course, an educated guess is a lot better than an uneducated one. This is one reason that local expertise and background research are important. Knowing the area and its history because you've studied it, you know that this isolated concrete slab may be the, all the remains of the abortive real estate development that serendipitously led to the discovery of gold in the area. So you know you'd better pay some attention to it. I haven't studied the area, so I don't know what the old slab may be important may be important and this may mean trouble for my client and me in an attempt to level the playing field and objectify the threshold of might be significant people sometimes establish more uh, or less arbitrary crit criteria for historic propertiness archaeologists are prone to this if there are 15 flakes of chert per square meter it may be a significant site if there are <clears throat> only 14, it's not. Applying such measures is fraught with per problems, of course, variation among observers with season, with vegetation cover, with the number of cows that have walked over the site, and so on, and the uncertain relationship between what's on the surface and what's present at depth. To say nothing of the fact that it is at base, an arbitrary measure whose relationship to the actual significance of a place is a, is tenuous at best. I bellabar all the this because some people get preoccupied with it, and it can be a source of great and sometimes expensive frustration. One SHPO of my acquaintance used to be terribly worried about making people spend money on insignificant archaeological sites. To avoid this odious result, he insisted that the significance of any site be proved through intensive subsurface testing. Testing, of course, costs money and takes time, so project proponents sometimes found themselves spending far more of both than they probably would have if they just accepted, this, accepted sites as significance and gotten on with managing them. And you have to remember that a place can be significant for multiple reasons. The site may actually contain only those 5.3 flakes you see.
on the surface, but the place where in the eyes of the Metomic tribe, the ancestor universe maker fought the star monster to the Metomic. It may not matter whether there are any flakes there. In fact, the only flakes the Metomic may notice are the archeologists asking dumb questions. Bottom line, there aren't any simple answers. We make judgment calls about what might and what might not be significant. And sometimes we're wrong, just as we're sometimes wrong about the decisions we make about marriage, child rearing, and which way to turn on an unfamiliar road. That's life. So we come out of an of an effort to identify historic properties with a list of places or maybe place types. <clears throat> in our apes for indirect or cumulative effects analysis that we think might be eligible for the National Register, how do we decide whether something is eligible? Naturally, we apply the criteria of eligibility 36 CFR 60.4 discussed in Chapter 3, the agency, usually meaning the agencies or regulated project proponents, consultants, overseen by the agency applies the criteria in consultation with the HPO and other consulting parties and tries to decide whether the property under consideration meets the criteria and hence is eligible, whether it falls under one of the criteria considerations and therefore is not eligible, and whether it falls under a criteria consideration but also meets one of the exceptions, <clears throat> in which case it's eligible. After all, got that? Evaluation is often the most time-consuming part of the selection or of the Section 106 process and one of the most contentious. Specialists can get into incredibly tedious arguments about whether a given criterion, criteria, consideration, or exception is met and what about whether a pr given place <clears throat> has sufficient integrity to even be considered for eligibility. We'll return to this issue later. Significance, eligibility, and what you want to do with the place. Remember that when you're evaluating a property to determine its historical significance, that's all you're doing. You're not determining what will or should be done with the property to put in another way. You're not letting management affect your evaluation. Evaluation is supposed to be done solely on the basis of historical, cultural, and other aspects of significance. You're not supposed to consider what you, your client, or anybody else wants to do with or to the place. You may be working for somebody who really wants to knock the old building down, and you may entirely support this intent. Maybe it's a matter of national defense, or maybe the building is full of toxic wastes that are poisoning the community, but that's no reason to say the building isn't historically or architecturally significant. If it really is, it's perfectly all right to say it's historically significant and we want to knock it down. What's not all right to say is we want to knock it down and therefore it's not historically difficult. significant. By the way, of analogy, imagine that you're examining a wetland. You're up to your knees in muck, alligators nibbling at your, at your tush. Your client wants to fill the wetland to build a hospital for abandoned urchins. You don't say that the wetland is dry just because you want to see the project go forward or even because you're tired of the gators. You acknowledge that it's a wetland and your client asks the Corps of Engineers for a permit to fill it. It's the same thing with a historic property. It may well be, be that nobody wants to preserve the thing. That doesn't matter. If it's historically significant, you acknowledge that it is and then think about whether to preserve it. And if not, what else can you can do with it? For example, document it and let it go. There is a big difference between federal law and the historic preservation ordinances of most local governments when something
is declared a local historical landmark, that usually means it's got to be preserved a preserved period, so there are lots of practical reasons for people to argue about whether it's significant enough to be designated under Section 106. Recognizing the significance of a place doesn't mean it's got to be protected. It merely means it has to be considered in planning. That's an important but poorly understood distinction with important ramifications. If you believe that everything that's historically significant must be preserved, then either you're going to make it po impossible to meet the changing needs of society, or you're going to have to be very selective about what you call historic. The latter, of course, of action is the only reasonable one, of course. But if it it's adopted what happens to all the historically significant places that can't practically be preserved if we're going to get on with life. The world is full of stuff that's got historic value but can't realistically be physically preserved, maybe shouldn't be preserved even in the most perfect wor of worlds, but should be documented before it's destroyed, commemorated in some way or compensated for. If you equate significance with physical preservation, you're inevitably going to wind up recognizing only a very narrow range of properties as significant. As an example, consider a steel launch tower at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, used during the Cold War to launch intercon intercontinental ballistic missiles on test firings into the Pacific Steel resting on an active military base, has no potential for public interpretations. Should we invest scarce tax money in preserving such a tower? Probably not. Should we document it before we demolish it? Probably so. But if we say that historical significance means a place must be preserved, we cannot recognize the historical significance of the launch tower without committing ourselves to preserving it. Frugal responsibility for the taxpayer's dollar will accordingly drive us to consider the tower to be non-historic and therefore not even recorded. The bottom line is that if you don't consider management factors when evaluating whether a place meets the register criteria, sorry, register criteria, that's not to say that you don't consider such factors when you decide how much analysis you need to determine eligibility or how far you have to go to prove it, unquote. Agencies regularly agree that something's eligible and get on with figuring out how to managing, manage it rather than going through the trouble of exhaustively analyzing its significance. On the other hand, project sponsors who feel they are being pressured to preserve submarginal properties may want to invest the time and treasure needed to nail down or disprove eligibility. Yes, it depends. Potential eligibility and still another definition of cultural resource Unquote. So let's say you found something you think might be eligible and it hasn't been formally evaluated. Perhaps you're a consultant and you've applied the National Register criteria and decided the thing is eligible. But the sponsor agency and the SHPO and THPO haven't done so officially, or perhaps even you haven't applied the criteria yet. Maybe you think don't think you have you have enough data what do you do what do you call this thing sometimes call people call such places potentially eligible this seems sensible through and on the surface but it's a mistake remember that section 106 requires agency to consider impacts on places that are included in or eligible for the national register not potentially eligible in theory. And in fact, this has happened in practice, particularly in the regulatory program of the core engineers. An agency can say, well, we need to consider properties that have been determined eligible, but we don't have to consider 
properties that are only potentially eligible until somebody other than us determines them eligible. This effectively puts us right back where we before were before Executive Order 11593 when Section 106 applied only to properties included in the register. The agency can ignore its impacts on a property until the SHPO, THPO, or the keeper may or maybe God determines it's el eligible. The eligibility determination process and the notion of agency responsibility for formally unevaluated properties turn on the notion of inherent eligibility under this doctrine, a property either inherently does or inherently doesn't meet the register criteria. A property that nobody's ever seen can be lying out there in the weeds or out, out in the woods, throbbing with eligibility, while another is weeping softly for its failure to possess this happy, happy quality. Of course, this notion uh, is est epistemologically absurd, Eligibility is a human mental construct, not a fundamental characteristic of a place like yellowness, acidity, pony trustness, or dog trotness. And what's not eligible today may be eligible tomorrow and vice versa. But if you carry this thinking very far, the whole National Register concept becomes pretty silly, a point worth considering. But for the moment, let's just note that unless we assume that eligibility is inherent, we have no logical basis for saying that agencies have the responsibility to concern themselves with and hence even identify places that may be eligible. They are responsible only for, for those that are determined to be eligible. Going back to our wetland analogy, when we go out to seek, if there's a wetland on development site and we think we sink into the muck up to our knees, we don't say. This is potential wetland. We say this looks and feels and smells a hell of a lot like a wetland. Let's check it against the definition of the Corps in the Corps of Engineers Section 404 Regulations. Unquote. Wetness is an inherent quality of the pro property. Our task is to recognize it and hold it up against established criteria to see if it's wet enough to merit attention in the regulatory process, just so with historic properties. But if we don't call our unevaluated place potentially <clears throat> eligible, what do we call it? Some people unfortunately call it a cultural resource. There's some logic in this sense. Cultural resource embraces a wider range of phenomena than historic property. It's reasonable to say that something is a cultural resource but may or may not be historic property. However, this doesn't re really resolve, really solve the problem of ensuring agency responsibility for considering the place. At best, it complicates it. You're really saying that the agency has to consider the place as a cultural resource under NEPA and other authorities but it has responsibilities under section 106. Only once somebody determines it to be eligible for the national register by applying the register criteria, worse, it leads to the impression that culture, cultural resource means an eligible property or property whose eligibility is undetermined, thus excluding from consideration all uh, the other broader things that the term logically embraces